Dinosaur King is a media franchise created and owned by Sega where dinosaurs transform to and from cards and can be summoned by people to do battle with one another. There's an arcade game, a DS game, a two season anime and trading card game or TCG. Dinosaurs are categorised into one of seven elements, lightning, earth, grass, wind, fire, water or secret. In this series I'll be going through and analysing the scientific accuracy of the species within each element. In this video we're going to be looking at the water element, home to perhaps the oddest mix of dinosaurs of the main six elements, the sauropods and the spinosaurid family of theropods, making it one of four elements the theropod group is split across in the franchise in addition to fire, wind and secret. Water move cards are quite varied as they range from using long whip-like streams of water to attack opponents, launching them into the air on water spouts, trapping them in bubbles to essentially drown them, and the coolest of all, summoning marine reptiles to attack for them. Let's first look at the Spinosaurids. They are a fascinating group of theropods from the Cretaceous. In Dinosaur King, the models all have the family's signature elongated snouts for catching fish, with the nostrils placed further up the snout than most theropods, thought to be an adaptation for catching fish with the head partly submerged in water. Along with this, they have crocodilian-esque slit pupils. It's impossible to say whether they had these since eyeballs don't fossilise, but I suppose it's reasonable if they did in fact spend a lot of time at the surface of water bodies like crocs, which slits are an adaptation for, though the most recent studies on Spinosaurus suggest it likely didn't spend much time at eye level with the water's surface, so this may not be as well supported now. They're also shrink-wrapped, with the fenestrae, the openings in the skull, being very visible through the skin, even though it would be obscured by soft tissues in life. They have pronated wrists like all theropods in the franchise, even though their palms should be facing each other. They have the correct number of fingers with three, and the first claw is shown to be considerably larger than the other two, as is known from their fossils. They also have four toes, the first Spinosaurid we're going to look at is Baryonyx. Its name means Heavy Claw, and it lived in England during the early Cretaceous, roughly 125 million years ago. Since it was first named in 1986, many specimens of Spinosaurids from other parts of Europe have been referred to this genus, but have since been given their own distinct genus names. These were all named years later, however, and this model does seem to be based on the materials still referred to Baryonyx. The head has the correctly shaped dip where the premaxilla meets the maxilla in the upper jaw. It also has the small crest on top of the head's midline. It has a row of spikes down its back. I don't know how reasonable that is, but it looks cool. On the whole, this is an awesome baryonyx for the time, and still is for the most part. Next we have Suchomimus. Its name means crocodile mimic, and it lived in Niger during the early Cretaceous, roughly 115 million years ago. Its head was especially elongated, even for Spinosaurids, and is correctly reconstructed here with the appropriate dip in the upper jaw. Its small head crest is also present. Whilst it didn't have the tall sail of Spinosaurus, which I'll talk about in a little bit, it did have tall neural spines on its vertebrae, which has been correctly portrayed as more of a ridge running the length of the animal's back. The only issue I can discern is that the legs look to be too long in proportion to the body. Perhaps this is why they made a whole running sequence in its episode of the anime? On the whole though, it's really good. Oh boy, the next genus we have is the big one. Spinosaurus, aka Spiny from the anime. It lived in Africa during the late Cretaceous, roughly 95 million years ago, and its name means spined lizard, after the enormous neural spines on its vertebrae, thought to have formed a huge sail on its back in life. First named in 1915, few dinosaurs have had makeovers since their discovery quite as extreme as Spinosaurus, many of which happened after the Dinosaur King model was made. With that being said, even for the time it's not quite right. 
when looking at the head, one can clearly see strong similarities with the Spinosaurus from Jurassic Park 3 from 2001. This is seen best with the crests. Both the JP3 and Dinosaur King models have two Allosaurus-esque crests just in front of the eyes. These are not present on the actual skull, which instead only has a single crest on top of the head's midline. Otherwise though, the head is correctly shaped. The biggest changes, however, are with the rest of the body. By modern reconstructions, the torso should be much longer. As such, the famous sail should also be longer. The shape of the sail is debated, however, the usual shape it takes is more like a trapezium or trapezoid, sometimes with a dip in the middle, rather than the parabola shape of older portrayals. The legs are also now considerably shorter, and unusually for theropods, it actually walked on its first digit, meaning it had four weight-bearing toes, and may have even been webbed for wading and or swimming, whereas here it has the more typical three, with the first toe being vestigial. Even the tail has had an update, as in 2020, new tail vertebrae attributed to Spinosaurus showed that they also had tall neural spines, interpreted as supporting a huge tail paddle. Whether this was used mainly for swimming, display, or both is still debated. So, on the whole, I... I mean, Spiny was already a bit dated in the mid to late 2000s, and by modern standards, he essentially acts like a time capsule for how we reconstructed Spinosaurus at the time. Eh, we still love you, Spiny. The last of the Spinosaurids is the depressingly named Irritator. It lived in Brazil during the early Cretaceous, roughly 110 million years ago. It was named as such due to the irritation the describers felt trying to acquire the fossil material, after fossil dealers had sold it to a museum in Germany, altered the skull with plaster after damaging it whilst excavating it. The only material referred to the genus Irritator specifically is a mostly complete skull. However, another genus, Angatarama, a contemporary of Irritator, preserves the tip of the snout, as well as postcranial material. Many researchers consider it a synonym of Irritator, and base most of the body on the material referred to Angatarama. However, since no overlapping fossils are known, this cannot be proven. Regardless, this model's head doesn't really reflect the skull material of either genus. Irritator had a very rectangular and boxy skull in profile, with a very blunt snout, whereas this model's is far too long and pointed. The crest is also really weird. Very different to any head crests I've seen on a Spinosaurid, so I don't know how reasonable this is. Whilst most of the body is unknown, it has been given a ridge on its back, as is suggested by the vertebrae referred to Angatarama. It may have also had a tail paddle similar to Spinosaurus, as Irritator, and by extension Angatarama, are thought to be more closely related to it than Baryonyx, for example, and so some restore it as more similar to the former. As such, the torso may be too short and the legs may be too long, based on the proportions of Spinosaurus. So, overall, this model wasn't a great representation of Irritator at the time, nor Angatarama for that matter, and is now even less so. Not great, really. We now reach one of the major groups of dinosaurs, the long-necked sauropods. In Dinosaur King, the models have the nostrils on the top of the head, which was thought to be correct at the time, but they are now thought to be at the end of the snout like in other dinosaurs. Some also seem to be shrink-wrapped and have exposed teeth similar to the theropods. They all have the correct number of fingers and toes with five digits on every limb. Whilst they should have one claw on the first digit of the hands and then three on the three innermost toes, the models are weirdly inconsistent with how many claws they have, when it should be universal. The hands are shown to be round, when they should be more lunate, that is, crescent-shaped. Their feet are also round, and quite elephant-like here, when they should probably be longer. All of the sauropods featured in Dinosaur King are also members of the group Eusauropoda, which includes all sauropods bar the most basal species. For the time, the posture they have is mostly correct. 
However, more recent reconstructions show that in new sauropods, the fused and wedge-shaped hip vertebrae angle the front of the body upwards, making the shoulders higher than the hips. We'll start off with the most basal members in the franchise. They typically had a very generalised bow plan, as they hadn't yet specialised into more diverse niches and developed the interesting adaptations they often bring about. Perhaps it's for this reason that the basal sauropods are all really good, helped by the fact they all have the correct number and arrangement of claws. The first sauropod genus we're going to look at is, fittingly, the first to ever be named, Cetiosaurus. Its name means whale lizard, as when its fossils were first found in England in rock dated to the Middle Jurassic, roughly 168 million years ago, they were thought to belong to a whale. Its neck and tail were actually on the short side for a sauropod, which are also correctly shown on this model. It's fitting that the first one ever found also happens to be a good example of essentially the archetypal sauropod, with no exceptional features. As such, I don't really have much to say other than it's a superb model of one of the first dinosaurs ever known to science. Next we have Patagosaurus. Its name means Patagonia lizard, as it was found in Argentinian Patagonia in rock data to the early Jurassic, roughly 178 million years ago. It's a very similar case to Cetiosaurus, as it's a basal, very nondescript sauropod that is reconstructed perfectly for the time, as the bodily proportions look spot on to the plentiful skeletal material we're lucky to have of this animal. Overall, another excellent model. Next we have Shunosaurus. Its name means Sichuan lizard, after the region of China where it was discovered in rock dated to the mid to late Jurassic, roughly 165 to 160 million years ago. As with the last two, the bodily proportions all look to be correct. All known skulls of Shunosaurus have been heavily compressed by rock during fossilization, making it difficult to determine the shape of the head in life, so I won't critique this aspect. Its most distinct feature was its ankylosaurine-esque club at the end of its tail, with two small spikes on the top, which is perfectly reconstructed here. Ignoring the unknown head shape, this model looks as perfect as it probably could be for the time. The last of the basal sauropods is Jobaria. It is named after the mythical creature Jobar in the folklore of the Tuareg people of Niger, where it was discovered in rock data to the Middle Jurassic, roughly 164 million years ago. The head looks to be the right boxy shape, and the neck, tail, and limb proportions all look spot on too. I know I'm repeating myself a lot, but again, it's a perfect reconstruction for the time. We now move into the more derived group of sauropods, fittingly called Neosauropods. This group is where the claws on the models become very varied for whatever reason. First we have Dicreosaurus. It lived in Tanzania during the late Jurassic, roughly 150 million years ago. It is the namesake genus of the family Dicreosauridae, which are famous for being quite small and having very short and probably bulky necks for sauropods. Its name means bifurcated lizard, after its neck vertebrae, which featured bifurcated neural spines on the tops, a signature of the family. Both this and the long, slender head are correctly reconstructed here, though the head should probably be held lower habitually. There are two species, but I'm inclined to say this represents the more complete type species, D. Hansmanni. The claws all look to be correct too, Another fantastic sauropod model. Next we have a pretty famous sauropod, Amargosaurus. It is named after the La Amarga formation in Argentina, where it was discovered in rock data to the early Cretaceous, roughly 125 million years ago. It was a fellow dicreosaurid, however, it took the neural spines to another level, having giant backwards curving neck spines. Whilst the spikes have been correctly reconstructed in terms of size and arrangement, with the first being only a single spine before becoming pairs the rest of the neck's length, for years it has been debated whether in life they would be covered in a keratin sheath or if they were covered in a pair of thin skin sails. 
This model has the keratin horn portrayal. However, the most recent studies suggest that they instead supported a large fleshy structure, possibly for display, species recognition, predator deterrence, or all of the above. For the time though, this is perfectly reasonable, and the rest of the animal looks great based on the known skeletal material, though it too may have held its head lower habitually like Dicreosaurus. The claws almost look to be the opposite for how they should be, with three on the hands and only one on the feet. Overall though, an excellent reconstruction of Amargosaurus for the time. Next up we have Camarasaurus. It lived in North America during the late Jurassic, roughly 150 million years ago. Its name means chambered lizard, after the hollow chambers in its vertebrae, which at the time were thought to be unique, but was later found to be very common in sauropods. There are four recognised species of Camarasaurus, and they are all very similar, making it difficult to determine which this model is meant to represent. Regardless, it is estimated to be about 12 or 13 metres long, which is a bit of an underestimate for even the smaller species, C. lewisi and C. lentus, which are commonly estimated to be at least 15 metres, with the largest, C. supremus, possibly being 23 metres long. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say it's meant to be the most common and best known species, C. lentus. The head shape and bodily proportions all look to be correct, and the animal is appropriately heavily built. However, this model has been given claws on all of its digits. Other than that, it's still pretty great. Now we've reached the extremely successful and diverse group of Cretaceous Neosauropods, the Titanosaurs. The first genus of this group we're going to look at is Saltosaurus. Its name means Salta Lizard, after the town of the same name in Argentina, near to where it was discovered, in rock data to the late Cretaceous, roughly 70 million years ago. This genus is known from relatively complete remains, and this is reflected perfectly in this model. Its short neck, long limbs, and broad torso, armoured with osteoderms, are all accounted for. It was actually the first titanosaur to be found with osteoderms, and it was initially thought to be unique, before later discoveries revealed it to be a common feature of the group. Their arrangement in life isn't known, but this looks very plausible. Unfortunately, this model too appears to have been given claws on all of its digits. Otherwise, it's a fantastic portrayal of Saltosaurus. Next we have Gondwana Titan. Its name means Titan of Gondwana, as it was discovered in Brazil in rock data to the late Cretaceous, roughly 70 million years ago, which at the time was part of the southern supercontinent Gondwana. Despite its name, it was actually a very small sauropod, at only 7 metres long. It is only known from incomplete remains, but what is known is that it had thin, gracile legs, which have been reconstructed on this model. Sadly, this model has been given claws on all of its digits too. The rest of the animal is mostly speculative, so I can't really comment on accuracy, but as far as I can tell, what is based on the fossils is pretty good. Next we have the enigmatic genus Titanosaurus. Its name means Titanic Lizard, and despite being the namesake for the Titanosauria group of sauropods, it itself is a dubious genus. It was named based on a few isolated vertebrae found in India in 1877, in rock data to the end of the Cretaceous 66 million years ago but they are non-diagnostic by modern standards to tell it apart from other titanosaurs. It became a wastebasket taxon for many titanosaurs that were assigned to the genus as different species, but most of them have since been given their own distinct genus names, one of which I'll talk about in a little bit. Years later, in 1933, a leg bone found in India assigned to Titanosaurus was reassigned to the South American genus Antarctosaurus, but in 1995 was reassigned again to the new genus Janosaurus. Along with other skeletal material referred to Titanosaurus discovered in India between 1917 and 1920, 
As such, it's possible this model is in fact supposed to represent Janosaurus. Even if this is the case though, Janosaurus is itself incompletely known, and so I don't think I can really meaningfully critique this model. It's just too unclear as of now. This brings us to the genus formerly considered Titanosaurus corberti, and is sometimes even referred to as such in Dinosaur King, Isisaurus. It was a contemporary of Janosaurus, and it is named after the Indian Statistical Institute, or ISI. It had quite a short but robust neck for a sauropod, which is reflected in this model. However, it also had very long forelimbs, which are not reflected unfortunately. It's been given osteoderms on its neck and back. These are only speculative, but several titanosaurs have been found with osteoderms, so I'd say it's plausible. This model does appear to have the correct claw arrangement as well. On the whole, it's a pretty good representation of Isosaurus. Next we have two genera for the price of one. Firstly, we have Nomegtosaurus. It is named after the Nomegt formation in Mongolia, where it was discovered in rock dated to roughly 70 million years ago. It is only known from a skull, which is reconstructed perfectly here. However, the body is speculative and possibly based on its contemporary and probable close relative, Opisthocelacordia. Its name means posterior cavity tail after its hollow tail vertebrae. Conversely, this genus is known from postcranial material, but no skull. As such, the head is speculative. Some researchers have suggested it and Nomegtosaurus may be synonymous, with the latter taking priority due to being named first. However, this is impossible to prove as of now, as no overlapping fossils are known. Interestingly, the model has been given thumb claws, even though no hand claws are known. It was thought that titanosaurs had lost their hand claws altogether. However, titanosaurs have since been found with hand claws, so maybe they were accidentally right to give it thumb claws? On the whole, it's difficult to judge, but both models are probably as accurate as they can be based on the note material, assuming they are separate genera. The last definite titanosaur genus is Ampelosaurus. Its name means vineyard lizard, after the, and I am preemptively sorry for any French viewers, the Blanquette de Lemur vineyard in France, near to where it was first discovered, in rock dates to the late Cretaceous, roughly 71 million years ago. So this genus has a caveat to it. As of when I'm making this video, there is currently a study being carried out looking over all the known material referred to Ampelosaurus and will supposedly move much of it to a new, as yet unnamed genus. As such, take everything I'm about to say with a pinch of salt, as our view of Ampelosaurus will likely change once the paper is published. With that said, when it comes to the head, I keep finding conflicting results on whether it had a more rectangular head in profile, a more triangular head, or if the back of the head was taller than the snout as is shown here. Osteoderms have been found in association with the skeleton, however their arrangement and position on the body and life is unknown. They are shown as the correct conical shape and this arrangement seems plausible to me. The claws do appear to be correct too. On the whole, it's hard to judge the accuracy, but I'd say it's still a pretty good Ampelosaurus, at least for the time being. The last sauropod and water dinosaur is Augustinia. It is named after Augustin Martinelli, a then student who helped excavate the skeleton in 1997 in Argentina from rock dated to the early Cretaceous roughly 110 million years ago. When it was first discovered, it was thought to have had rows of upward curving spines along its back. These, however, were later found to be disarticulated rib and hip bones. The only known skeleton is fragmentary and poorly preserved, making much of this model speculative. Because of its fragmentary nature, it has been difficult to place on the sauropod family tree, and is the main reason why I decided to stick it at the end. Because it was so unusual, it was originally placed into its own family, Agustinia Day, which has not been widely accepted as a valid family. It was later placed into the Titanosauria, the Diplodocids, 
and even as a dubious genus due to the lack of well-preserved material, in 2022 it was placed in the family Rabachisauridae, closely related to the Dicreosaurids and Diplodocids. How long this placement will last remains to be seen. If being restored as a Rabachisaurid, the snout should probably be wider, the head held lower, and the tail longer. On the whole, it's a very difficult animal to reconstruct, and it's based on what is now a heavily outdated portrayal, so I don't really know how to judge its accuracy. It's an unfortunate case for Agostinia. Dinosaur King's water element is quite extreme in terms of accuracy, as its species are cases of either wonderful for the time, or extremely outdated, with very little in between. In general, the sauropods are still excellent, even with the outdated features. The four spinosaurs are split right down the middle. Two are excellent, and two are not so excellent. Altogether though, there's far more hits than misses, so I'd say it's held up pretty well in terms of accuracy. I'd like to thank my good friend The Cobra Effect, and recommend you check out my friend and fellow Paleo YouTuber, The Casual Prince 8, and his videos on Dinosaur King if you're a fan. Thank you guys so much for watching, and please do check out my other videos and subscribe, as it helps a ton. Bye bye now.